Okay, so uh, then I will start. And um, good morning, everyone. This is Ole from Saiga Conservation Alliance. And today we are going to do something very new and exciting. Uh, this is the first time we are rolling out our uh, drawing masterclass. Uh, and the focus of this masterclass is our all time favorite antelope, the Saiga antelope. Um, and it's my big pleasure uh, to introduce you our special guest for today, Dr. Julius Chutani. Uh, Dr. Julius is a natural history illustrator and biologist. Um, having a PhD in natural history, he also does striking illustrations for books, museums, and uh, scientific organizations. So uh, he is a very inspiring artist, and I believe it's uh, fair to say that dinosaurs and prehistoric creatures are his specialty. Um, however, he also has got interest for a wider scope of wildlife, uh, and because of that, we are lucky to have him with us today. Uh, teaching all of us wildlife flowers how to create our own Saiga antelope image. So on this note, let's welcome Dr. Julius uh, and I will give him a chance to introduce himself. Thank you very much, Olya. That's uh, some very kind words and I appreciate uh, you having me here on this uh, show and the first one of your drawing masterclasses. It's very exciting to be able to do that and um, I, I'm just very happy to be involved in some way, another way to promote conservation initiatives. So uh, this is great. And yeah. Um, yeah. So exciting. Uh, thank you so much for your time and your creativity. My pleasure. And it's always nice to see um, these kinds of things uh, being done to help increase awareness about wildlife that need help. Um, so yeah, so my name is Julius Chetany and I am a biologist by training and uh, right now I'm a scientific illustrator and natural history artist. Um, and I use, uh, what I do to make a living basically is uh, work with scientists and museums and book publishers um, and various other organizations to uh, visualize uh, wildlife and all sorts of natural history subjects. Awesome, so let's, let's start. Uh, so what we're gonna do is, um, I'm going to start with uh, a Saiga portrait, like that wonderful little creature there uh, standing behind Rolia there. Um, and uh, these are some of my favorite bovids or antelopes. Uh, they are just wonderfully wonky looking. Just They look so beautifully goofy with their nose. Um, that snout is just amazing. And um, we're going to do this by introducing also some interesting information about this animal. Um, both I and Olya will be talking about them. Uh, and there's so many interesting facts to learn about this animal and, 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 and things that, that, that scientists have um, uncovered about them. Uh, such a fascinating uh, species of animal. So I'm going to select here now my um, two colors. So to make this easy to tell apart, I'm going to do the guide shapes in red and then the details in black. And then these were gonna be on two separate layers. And so it'll be pretty easy for me to be able to turn off one or the other. And hopefully we'll be able to be easier to see the difference between the two as well when, uh, when you're able to um, uh, look at this on, on the screen. So first of all, I'm going to go here and start, go into the proper layer here and we're going to select um, a, a pen, I guess. There we go. Okay, so this is what it'll look like. Okay, and that's, that's gonna be the first uh, color. And then when I switch into the final details, I'll put those ones in black. Um, for now, we're just gonna stay with red. And, um, oops, computer behaves properly. Okay, good. All right, so, uh, this is kind of the layout of the screen here. Uh, this is sort of an A4 size. So what we want to start with is um, making a, a an oval shape, kind of like an egg. And we will start in the sort of the lower uh, right hand third of the page. And it'll look like this. It's a little bit of a the smoothest egg <laughs> it can be. It's okay. It's fine if it's like that. Um, okay. So these are going to be, this doesn't look much like a saiga antelope yet, but that's okay. It's going to develop. It's normal like this, I suppose. Uh, the next thing we're going to do, and we want to pay attention to the relative size and position of these different shapes, because these will help us to guide the overall 
um, shape of the animal. That first one is kind of going to be the main part of the head. This next one is going to be representing the snout of the animal. And again, it doesn't look much like it yet. But you see where I put this oval shape or egg shape is going to help us to kind of determine where the snout should be. Okay. And so first of all, we'll put a few of these shapes in. It makes it easier to see uh, the overall shape that we're looking at. This is going to next represent kind of the the animal's um, orbits or like the areas in the skull where the eyes are. Uh, one of the neat things about the saiga and a lot of these, these um, herbivores or uh, plant-eating animals that live on, on wide open plains is they have these really big, um, big eyes and, and, and well set out from the skull. So they kind of bulge outward and then they have this, this kind of stereo vision where they can see almost every direction around them, which is very important because predators um, can sneak up on them from any direction and they have to be, while they're eating, to be aware of these, right? Um, and so here now we're going to put the, the guide shape for its near side eye. We're going to look at this animal mostly from the side here, just to give you an idea. And it's pointing to the left, so it'll become obvious as we draw it, but just to give you an idea of which way things are pointed. So that's going to be representing the eye within the orbit, because the orbit is that, and, and it's really nice that you have that, the picture of the saiga behind you there, Oya. You can actually see the way that, that works, so these massive uh, sort of bulging eye um, areas that, that house the eyes that, that allow them to see all around. It's, it's really neat. Now, within the eye here, within this circle, um, we're going to put this line here that represents kind of the eyelid of the animal. Saigas have this, um, and kind of like goats as well, to which they are related in, in some way, um, they have these, these eyes that, that kind of wrap around a little bit, and um, these eyelids kind of, in the middle, they kind of droop down a little bit, uh, and they have these, these pupils that allow them to see such wide areas around them. That's kind of the eyelid um, there. Now, um, we're going to put in the opposite side uh, orbit. Now, the reason is because this animal is, is mostly from the side. So it's kind of like a little bit of view, sort of a little bit, little bit pointed toward us, but mostly from the side. So we're still gonna be able to see the bulge of, of where the eye would be on the other side of the animal. So that's what we're doing here. We're gonna make this kind of potato shape um, as well on that side. Like this, actually it doesn't even have to go any further than that inward. So I'm just going to make a little dotted line here. It doesn't matter. Um, really what's important is that outside edge. We put first. Okay. Um, now the, the snout, uh, it, I, this is, this is the, the most wonderful part of this animal, I think is, and it so sets it apart from other types of, of antelopes. Is this amazing snout. So this is the tip of the snout. I'm going to put it here, and it's represented by a small egg shape, just like that. And it's it's an it's such a it looks like a vacuum cleaner head in some ways, I guess you could say. It's got these really big nostrils, and and it ends in this this sort of flat area that almost has like a folding forward, like book like uh, shape, and 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 it it ends this enormously enlarged snout, um, huge um, nasal cavity. Uh, we're going to connect the, that, that little egg that we just drew to the, 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 the big snout egg uh, with this line here. That from the top of that little egg to there, basically. Okay. So that kind of helps to connect the tip of the snout where the nostrils are, which is that small egg, to the bigger uh, enlarged nasal area. Uh, and also, I'm going to take the back end of that head circle, the very first one that we drew, or the head oval. We're going to give it a little bit of a corner at the bottom. So you go to the bottom of that back here and make a little bit of a corner like that. That's going to represent the jawline, the back of the jaw. So these animals um, don't have as rounded as I showed initially uh, on, on their jaw, but it has a little bit of a corner there. So that helps to define the shape that we're working on. Now, uh, the nostrils. 
So this, this is one of the neat things on this animal here is that it's got really big nostrils compared to other types of uh, antelopes, its relatives. Uh, so what you do is you go to the front of this snout, this smaller egg shape that we drew, and we're gonna draw two little, how do you call these shapes? It looks like this, not quite ovals, like half ovals, I guess, almost. One there and one next to it right here. Like that. And these look very different from, like other animals have some of these sort of uh, almost flat fronted uh, nostril areas as well, like some, like pigs do, but they look very different from that. Um, the, these have, the, these are much more open, much larger nostrils than those of, of pigs and other animals that have sort of flat fronted noses as well. And um, well, yeah, can you tell us something about why what is the reason for this this unusual <laughs> large snout and nostrils? Yeah, this uh, so this is probably one of the coolest feature of the saiga, um, and there are a few reasons for that. So uh, first of all, it's just a biological adaptation, uh, given the climate situation where uh, the saigas live. So uh, basically, they live in extreme temperatures, um, and during the summer it gets very hot, and the area is very deserted. So for this uh, period of time, they need nose to filter the air. Uh, and many people assume that they have uh, a fantastic uh, sense of smell, but it's not unfortunately quite true uh, because they basically use the nose to filter the air. Uh, however, in winter time, the temperatures are extremely low and um, the adaptation changes a bit. And so in this case, they use their nose as a heater, uh, which is another cool thing that uh, these animals can adapt to such uh, different uh, surroundings and the situation where they live. Um, but another cool thing about this nose is that uh, during the mating time, uh, it also becomes larger uh, and so that the animal, the male in this case, uh, looks even more representative, uh, representative and big. So lots of fun things going on with this nose. That is really interesting stuff. And it, it, it's so, so fantastic to, to, to see how animals um, have evolved to specific environments that, that, that you know, they have these characteristics that help them to survive better. And it's just so obvious sometimes visually. It's not always the case. Sometimes we, you know, there are certain types of enzymes or other types of physiological traits they have that maybe we can't easily see. But this is a really wonderful example of a very visual trait that's very obvious. And it's interesting to see that, how it's also used during the mating season for the males to be able to compete with each other visually as well. That's, that's so interesting to see that in animals. Um, really cool. Yeah, really. I like, guess and their mouth is just underneath all of that. And so uh, that's what I'm going to put in next here. Um, and so you have this kind of a little, at the bottom of that big snout oval, we're just going to put kind of a little mouth and this very slight curve in it. You can curve in either direction a little bit, but it looks kind of funny now. It, it looks like a balloon animal, the way it's put together like this. And, and I guess, you know, if we were to leave it with guide shapes, yeah, it would very much be sort of a balloon animal. Um, but it's going to be more interesting than that, hopefully. Uh, the, the next thing that I want to do, and, and while you were talking, I, I zoomed in a little bit here as well, so that we have a little bit more, a better view of it. May as well make use of the screen better if we can. But, you know, keep in mind, it's only a portion of the, of the uh, page. Uh, but here we're going to put in the, the neck uh, guidelines. And so one of them is going to come from the bottom of the, the throat here. Start and just a little curved line coming down like that. And then one uh, connecting sort of the top of the head, neck here, little curved line. And then because there are these big muscles in the neck, and actually if you look at your own neck, you can see that there are these large muscles that, that um, come off the side of your neck. And there's these grooves that, that um, uh, show up where at, at the edge of those muscles. And that's kind of what we have here is this, you can make a kind of a, a, a thin or a dotted line here is kind of a showing the bit of a groove that outlines one of these sort of large muscle groups in the neck. So that kind of helps to put the head on top of the body of the animal basically by the neck. So the next thing we're going to do is um, go back. I'm going to zoom out a little bit because we're going to do the horns. And the horns are another really neat feature of this, these animals. Um, beautiful horns. And I guess especially in the, the Russian saiga, right? Because the Russian saiga has the larger horns of the two, I believe. The, the Mongolian saiga has smaller ones, but... 
Yeah, so um, basically, yeah, there are two subspecies of cypress, uh, and the one found in Russia is also common in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, whereas a subspecies in Mongolia is uh, a little bit different from the other one. Uh, and that's true, they, they have uh, some visual differences. So, for example, the horns, and you're correct in that, uh, they may look bigger. However, it also depends on the age of the animal. So the older the animal gets, uh, the longer the horns uh, become eventually. So they don't lose their horns, um, like some of the other species. Um, and it just stays there uh, with them throughout the entire life. That's really neat. And they're really beautiful horns too. These um, very, uh, these nice ribs that, that um, form along them, uh, they just make them look so impressive actually. And I, but I imagine they, they must be pretty sharp looking <laughs> too, so it's probably best to, to be careful if, if, if you're around them. So what I'm going to do to draw these horns is kind of a, a different way. This is to make it a little bit easier to draw two horns that are side by side on an animal that we're looking at, not from the front, not exactly from the side, but sort of in between. Uh, and so it looked kind of funny at first, but bear in mind, just bear with me and, and it'll become obvious why we're doing it this way. So we're going to start at the, the orbit that's on the opposite side of the head and go up and watch this weird shape that we're going to make. Comes up and then curves like this and then curves back. So imagine kind of like a really weird tall hairdo. <laughs> sort of, um, kind of a slightly forward tipped uh, at the top. And the reason we're doing it this way is because now we have the outline for both horns in one stroke. And the next thing that we're going to do is put in the inner edge of each horn. And it's not connected. The, the, the horns, are, the two horns are not connected. So we're going to be able to sort of erase out or, 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 or make less visible afterwards that connection. But this will help to put both horns in. So one horn, we're going to finish the inner side like this. It's very narrow at the tip. And then it comes and widens out toward the eye like that. So that's one of the horns. That's the one near us. And then the other horn, uh, we're going to start again at near the top, but not quite where the other one started, but there's a gap between them. And it goes like this, just like that one. Gets a little thicker as you go toward the bottom. And then, so they, they don't meet at the bottom, but the way that the animal is turned, one of them is sort of in front of the other a little bit. And so that's why it looks like they meet at the bottom. But as you can see, really nicely, again, the picture behind Olya there, it shows an animal facing us, and you can see how the horns are separated at the, at the bottom. They don't actually meet. But we have a different angle here. Okay, so that's, that's the, um, the overall horn shapes. Uh, now we can add some of those, those really nice ribs that are on the horns that give them this ornamented look. So the, it's really simple. We're just going to put um, several lines crossing the horn. And they have a very particular kind of a shape. Um, now, th these lines, kind of slightly S-shaped, a um, little curve, and each of these actually, each of these lines will mark, the say, the top of one of these thicker ribs. The ribs are actually quite thick, um, so I'll show you in a second how that works, but we're just going to put a few of these lines in, crossing the horn, and then you can see how it kind of changes in the angle as we go toward the top, um, it's it's a very specific kind of a way that they are, and and, we, and it changes depending on the angle that you look at it from. And then on the other horn, and you'll see that on the other horn, these shapes slightly different curvature looking because we're looking at that from the inside outward, like rather like from the or the, the inner side of the horn or the animal's center. So um, the, the curvature is sort of complex. It goes up and down and up and down around the horn. Uh, and then you get these kinds of uh, interesting curves. Now, each of these ribs, uh, each of these lines represents something that's a little bit thicker. So really, if we were to draw in the whole rib, and we can add that afterwards, um, I'll take this one here as an example. It'd be more like this in thickness. This kind of would just kind of show you the bottom edge of it. That's kind of how each of these ribs are, right? So they're quite quite thick. Um, just for now, because these are the guide shapes, I'm going to leave it at that. 
Um, the other thing to remember is that on top here, this connector here, um, when we're finished, you can actually remove that. You can erase that out afterward and just there to indicate that. But for now, I'm just gonna move on to the next stage, which is the ear. So I just have these, actually they're relatively short little ears um, compared to some other antelopes. You see some antelopes with really big ears. These guys have quite short ears. Um, Olia, can you tell us about why that might be that they have pretty short ears? Um, the thing is, uh, their ears don't have um, such a huge importance when it comes to uh, adaptation mechanisms that, that, that they have in order to survive. So for them, it would be more uh, other features like the speed uh, and their nose. That's why they don't uh, emphasize the use of their uh, ears, like in terms of evolution. Uh, and that's why they don't, like they didn't have the reason to develop them very strongly. Um, but if we go back to the horns, for example, that are very close. Uh, so the horns actually have uh, some more interesting features. And uh, this is more to uh, point out that uh, there is a difference between, between males and females. So if uh, we talk about the horns, only males have them and not the females. Um, and also uh, horns, unfortunately, is the reason why the saga populations are declining these days. Uh, and that is because saga horns are harvested for uh, traditional Chinese medicine um, and sometimes they can be used also as a symbol of uh, status uh, in some of the communities so uh, this is unfortunately right now the reason that brought cygus to extinction to the brink of extinction not the total extinction of course. Yeah, that's very concerning and, and that's actually a good point um, thank you for bringing that up because that was something that goes really well with the, the horn so that's that's frightening and I'm um, I didn't know initially, actually, until recently, that, that the horns were hunted so much uh, of this species. And, and I know that's the case for a lot of different animals with horns. And it's really sad to see that something like that happens with, with saiga as well. And um, these, are, these, these are, are, are very sort of um, uh, kind of deeply cultural, but not, not scientifically supported uh, reasons for them to be using the horns either. And, and so this is something that is important for us to, to keep in mind is that this is another reason why it's, it's unnecessary for them to be hunted this way, right, for the horns. It's not even, not even based in, 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 in very good reason for it. And, and, and it's unfortunate that that's happening. And this is why it's so nice to be able to have um, outreach that, that helps to reach people to, to encourage them to seek different ways uh, rather than, than hunting them. Yeah, so. that's for sure. And, and a lot of it comes from uh, some cultural backgrounds and traditions. And uh, many of those things are quite outdated these days. And we have so many other substitutes. So just recognizing that is also very helpful um, so that we can move on with uh, new traditions. That's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense to me. Um, so there you go. And that's uh, that's the horns and then the ears as well as as Olya was saying that their hearing is not particularly as as used as as for example sight um, um, right on these guys and then um, the other thing is um, if I'm not mistaken these guys actually live in compared to other areas they have a, a pretty cold environment for a lot of the year compared to a lot of other antelopes and one of the things that we see in in um, animals that live in cold environments is that their limbs and their ears and such become relatively small and shortened. Um, and this is an evolutionary advantage to cold because the, the larger something is, the more it, it radiates heat, in, especially in warm-blooded animals. And so if it's smaller, it helps them to conserve heat. They also have pretty short legs, I guess, right? Relatively speaking to something compared to like a giraffe. <laughs> so um, another sort of good example. They're pretty narrow legs, though, I guess, though, too. But the, the ears are pretty short and squat. So that's kind of like, I've got the two ears now is just kind of little sort of lemon shapes almost <laughs> sort of on the sides. Um, and then the last thing that we want to add to this here is to these guide shapes is, is certain features on the face that help to define it. And so one of the things is that um, these animals have, so uh, first of all, there's, there's a, actually a little, little guide down here by underneath the nose just a little bit of a connector line between the tip of that nose and then the, the area near the mouth there. Like that. Um, the snout has often these kinds of like, almost like accordion ridges <laughs> kind <laughs> of. Um, and, and are these, uh, and I'll, as I draw them in, I, I'm gonna ask you, are these kind of used to, 
is how mobile is that that snout that enlarged snout and 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 what are, are, are these these lines that you see on some of them sometimes like this um are they areas where they can kind of move the snout a little like contracted or how does that work yeah so it's quite movable actually and uh if you look it up uh you can see some pretty funny images of the saiga when they try to turn their, their head and then you know it totally the head is there but the snout is somewhere else so <laughs> <laughs> it looks uh quite amusing but yes it's actually quite soft uh, and very movable and so um it's kind of like um, those fringes that you find uh on the snout is basically um just just the type of material let's say and so it's not uh it's not like a hard muscle so it's not um contracted like in a very strong way and that's why you can see this very uh typical shape for the saiga oh that's neat that's interesting it's uh, and it makes them look even more wonderfully goofy when they when they move <laughs> their snout in various ways it's, 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 funny. Yeah. it's almost like the trunk of an elephant isn't it in some ways um it's it's or like um like a tapir um, and you see that in their skulls too, uh, how it's similar in that sense. There's this really big, really big hole in the top of the skull, just like you would have on some of those animals with very um, uh, mobile and, and large snouts like on tapers and elephants. Um, very interesting to see that when you look at the skull as well. And you guys like, see that and you're like, aha, that's got to be a snake. <laughs> and you can repeat them. It's really interesting. <laughs> So we have here a few, and there's a, there's a few little wrinkles sometimes in front of the ear that you see. Um, there's a little bit of a, a groove here that you often see under the, the nose going up to the snout. And again, this is that enlarged sort of nasal area um, that is, is being sort of separated out by, by a visible groove. Uh, and then there's also a little bit of a, sometimes you see a little bit of a groove under the, the mouth like under the mouth area like that. And then there's one other thing here is this, um, now I, I think you'll have to help me with what this is called. In front of the eye, there's this little dark area. Um, yeah, go on. Right, uh, I, to be honest, I don't even know how to call it in English, but yes, it's, um, it's just some typical coloring um, scheme that they have. So it's just part of their, um, and, and sagas change color uh, throughout the year. So for example, in summer and in winter, they are quite different. So in summer, they would be more like beige color, uh, something that you see on my background. Uh, whereas in winter, they turn white and become more fluffy. And so um, they're this, those like darker uh, patterns under their eyes um, change also depending on the season. And uh, you can especially see them um, during the mating time. Because uh, again, in males, uh, it becomes darker and more visible. Oh, interesting. Okay, so it's almost like a like a gland, like sort of a thing, isn't it? And almost like a lacrimal gland, gland or something. Yeah. I, I should know this. I don't remember exactly what it is. I just remember visually that this this happens. Um, okay, yeah, very interesting. And so, oh, by the way, we should say too, right, that this one that we're drawing here is is a summer coat of an animal. So it's it's got a uh, smaller amount of fur and imagine its coloration and I guess you guys can all color it too after you finish. This is one of the fun things about this kind of drawing so you can color it in. Um, but this one based on how the shape is and, and the, the length of the fur is is more typical of the summer coat of the animal. Yeah so. that's that's very true because the proportions would also change if you try to draw a winter coat for example. It will be more like bigger, fluffy, bulkier. They, they, they look really special when they have the full <laughs> fur. And it's, it's, it's great. So oh, yeah. what I'm going to do is switch the colors now um, to do sort of the, the outline, the, to put the, the details in place. We've used our guide shapes here and now it's just really going to be easy to do this sort of final um, details on this one uh, so that it looks less like a bunch of ovals and more like a continuous line for the animals. All we have to do really for that is um, a switch to black in my case. And um, you can actually even, like I said, you can erase out some of these parts, like for example, that, that space between the horns. Um, and if you want to, you can, you can lightly erase some of the lines that we've put in place, but it might be better to hold on to them for now until we put in these sort of details. And it's really easy. We'll start at the tip of the snout um, like this, and I'm just going to make sure I'm the right layer and then just kind of follow along the, the outside of this line, but not the inner parts. And then up here, uh, we'll follow up the forehead, which is this part here up toward the horn. 
and I'll stop there. And then I'll, I'll continue by starting at that orbit, or that bony area that holds the eye on the other side of the head. Like this, come up toward the horn and kind of just you know, put a little dotted line across the horn like that. The same place we have the, the ear sticking out. So I'll just kind of outline that exactly the same shape as I set up. And uh, for the horn, now, for the horn, imagine these lines that we drew across it, those cross pieces, those ribs. As I mentioned, they're all pretty thick, actually, each one of them. So when we're going to draw the outline of the horn, just keep that in mind. And we're going to add a little bit of a bump to this outline each time that we have one of these cross pieces um, to show that. So here is what's going to happen. I'm going to go up and then a little bump here. Up again, a little bump. And keep going like this all the way up the horn well for the lower part and then as you get toward higher and higher on the horn those whoops those bumps become smaller because the ribs become less distinct and toward the top they actually vanish entirely and you have just this wonderful curvature in that horn and it's a complex curvature too it curves forward and backward and inside and outward. Um, and then when we start coming back down the other side, we start to add little bumps at the top where each of those cross pieces is. And then as we go down, these bumps become a little bit larger. Toward the bottom of the horn, they're a you know, good size, like the ones we have on the other side of the horn. Like that. These guide shapes help us to know where to put those bumps, so like that. And then I do exactly the same thing with the other horn, starting at the bottom, in the front side, bump each time we come across one of these cross pieces. So again, that just kind of shows us that there is a, a ring, a raised ring around the horn at that point. And, and it makes them look very attractive. Antelopes and, and their relatives have the most beautiful range of different kinds of horns. Such a wide diversity among different types of antelopes. And oops, I made a little mistake there. I have to do a quick little erase. <laughs> and coming down the other side and start with small bumps at the top. Each time we come across one of these cross pieces, and they grow a little bit as we go down. You don't have to do it in one continuous line like I'm doing right here. Um, it can be done or you can sketch it as you go. It doesn't matter, whatever works best. And then we get to the bottom like that. And now we have the outline of the horns. And this is a, a very interestingly complex kind of horns these guys have. Then at the bottom of that horn, you can actually add a little bit of like little dotted lines or little lines of kind of fur where the, the horn and the, the fur meet, basically. Now, behind the horn, we'll continue the, the head down toward the ear, and then I'll stop at the ear, and I'll start at the base of the ear and just outline it just like it was, set up with the guide shape, that sort of weird little lemon shape or clam shape. I don't know what you, you would call this kind of a shape. It's, um, it's a weird one. And then we have those edges here that show us where the ear is sort of open forward. And then that, those two lines in the center there basically just show us where the, 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 the fur, the long furs in the ear meet toward the center. And then um, you can actually color that center in like this. And if you wanted to show those furs, because these are quite long furs um, on the sort of the front inside of the ear, you can just make little lines like this. They're kind of facing inward. And you can see this if you have like a dog or a cat, for example, you can look at their ears and you see similar kinds of patterns happening there. Okay, so that's the ear on our side. Um, you can even add these little bit of wrinkles here next to the ear since we're near it. Then I'll continue with the neck, the top of the neck going backward, just like the line we set up before. And now I'm going to have to actually just move this up a little bit so that I can see the bottom. There we go. 
Uh, the next thing is I'm going to continue again from the front and go backward from the nose. And so the nose, now we can just finish up that, that round front part of the nose where it's sort of flat and add those nostrils in the same way. There's a huge nostrils. And you can actually fill them out with black if you like, because just to show that they're darker inside or even just hatched lines, sort of like little lines next to each other even to make it sort of a half tone or color them in with gray or whatever, or dark gray, you know, whichever makes them look dark. They're, they're gaps basically, or they're holes. Uh, then we have these, these little accordion lines a little bit. These vary in how visible they are on the, on the snout, right? Um, and then the little groove under the nose itself. Then I'll go down from the base of that round part of the nose down toward the mouth and then draw the mouth in like this. Um, they actually sometimes have a little bit of a, a lip visible too, so you can add a little bit if you want. Mm -hmm. And then underneath the chin, the chin comes backward. <laughs> it's funny, they almost remind me of sharks in some ways, the way that their mouth is underslung or or starts a little bit back of the nose, underneath the, the head. So in that sense, wow. they're, right, they're, they're more like, like sharks in the way their mouth is set up than most antelopes are. <laughs> <laughs> Who would know? <laughs> yeah, it's something, I, I just draw so many sharks, especially on these kinds of drawing sessions that um, right. I'm more aware of certain visible kind of <laughs> relations, I guess. <laughs> it's brilliant that you pointed out. <laughs> I never thought of that. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> oh, and now to connect the, the the base of the chin here to the rest of the of the of the head here, just you know, this is not going to have to be as too sharp uh, connect corner here. So we'll just kind of make it a little bit smoother and continue toward the back here, and then in, and then go out to the back of that that jawline that we drew is that corner, and then just kind of just end it with a little bit of a dotted line because there's not a very sharp line at the back of the the head as it connects to the neck, uh, unless they're turning their head toward you, in which case you get a bit of a fold there, right? as we get with many animals. Uh, the throat continues down from here and just exactly the same line as you drew before. And again, that little dotted line to show the groove where the muscles of the neck um, show up like that. Then the last things to add here are the eyes. Now, the way that we've set up the orbit on this animal you don't have to draw the whole um, oval there, basically, but rather uh, there is kind of a a bit, of, it, it's visible on top, so there's a bit of a line here, like on the orbit on the other side, and then it kind of kind of, kind of peters out a little bit, it kind of stops a little bit, and then there, there's again a bit of a shadow often visible on the, the underside of the orbit, um, especially because they bulge out and that shadow makes them look more visible. And then the eye, we're gonna, we're gonna draw the, from the eyelid first here. So I'm gonna take that line that we set up for the eyelid and just follow that along, bit of a curve, and then go to the bottom of the eye from there. Same way we drew that. Now for the top of the eye, the upper part of the eyelid, I'm not gonna make that into one continuous line, but I'm gonna make it sort of a little bit of a dashed line because it's, it's not really heavily set off. It's, it's basically a fold. And then that little dark sort of gland or whatever that, that coloration is in front of the eye, you can just kind of also draw that according to the same way that we had it in the guide shape. It almost looks like a teardrop. <laughs> um, and if you want, you can fill in the eye. It's, it's very dark uh, in general. Um, and uh, what I like to do in eyes when they're shiny like this is you put a little bit of a reflective um, dot in the center, not in the center, but rather sort of where the sun's uh, um, image would be reflected. So often near the top of the eye, and if you imagine that the light is coming from the front, then we can just put that, that reflected point of light from the sun maybe in the front top. I'll make a little circle here, and then I'll fill in the rest of the eye with black. The eye, the actual... Um, the visible part of the shiny part of the eye is just that lower part of this circle. That. We'll leave the eyelid separate and, and clear for now. There you go. Um, so now, oh, actually, one other thing we can add is there's, 
their, their snout is really neat because we're we're looking at it from the side here mostly, but the, the one behind you, Olya, there is, is is nicely shown from the front. You can see that groove down the center of the of the snout there. And so we can actually represent that a little bit on this image too by a little dotted line near the top edge of the snout here, near the top edge because we're seeing it mostly from the side, but it's still visible from this angle. Okay, so now if we were to actually remove, oh well, actually, sorry, one last thing is that I didn't put those, those cross pieces in, uh, on the horns in the, the final. So I'm just gonna put a few of these cross pieces in, in, in the, the dark color, maybe underneath them even a little bit, where the bottom of those bulges start. That's the last thing that we need for this portrait. After that, you can go and, and mostly erase out the guide shapes that we put in underneath uh, this dark color, because those ones are no longer going to be necessary. Uh, and so you can either lightly erase them out, being careful not to erase the final shapes that you made, the final lines, or um, you can leave them in, that's fine too. But it helps if you're able to remove them a little bit, or this is why we made these, these, these final lines darker so that they're more visible. Now, I have the ability to actually, because this is digital, I can reduce the, the brightness or, or the the, the darkness of those, those guidelines. And when I do that, this is what happens. Um, and we have what looks much more like a Saiga antelope uh, in, in its sort of the final drawing stage. And, and th that's what you should basically have once you remove mostly those lines. That's the portrait of the animal. 